pianist. I'm a classically trained pianist, but I play jazz for a living. Uh, uh, or or let's, let me rephrase that. I make money playing jazz. And, and then... Um, and then in my misbegotten youth, I played in a very loud heavy metal progressive rock band, so I've lost a good chunk of my hearing. Uh, I am a, a composer, I have a master's in composition, I write all sorts of music, some of it you would like, some of it you'd probably go, oh, he's wacko. And then I'm, an, a music, I'm a musicologist, which is the academic term for music historian, I'm an American music historian. And I did uh, my work in Los Angeles. I did research on jazz in Los Angeles from 1915 to 1955, where I interviewed musicians who had actually played in Los Angeles during that period of time. I uh, interviewed musicians who, had, who played with Louis Armstrong. Um, I tried to interview Barney Bagard, who was a clarinetist for uh, the uh, Duke Ellington band, uh, but he was writing a book at the time and wasn't want, willing to share anything with me. And then I never saw the book after, after he died, so I have no idea what he didn't want to share with me. Uh, and I've been teaching, I taught music history at, in college for years. I was at Merrill Hurst for 18 years. And after I left uh, Merrill Hurst, I started freelancing my knowledge to various senior facilities around the region, which is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. So I didn't retire from teaching, I just changed um, the environment I was teaching in. And so now I'm here to talk to you about um, Tin Pan Alley and American music and the, uh, culture and the American music industry. Uh, <clears throat> so Tin Pan Alley is the probably one of the most important um, musical entities in American music. It has had a huge impact on both culture and the music industry in itself. Uh, and in fact, before Tin Pan Alley, we can talk about a music business. After Tin Pan Alley, we can talk about a music industry. And so Tin Pan Alley refers to two different, oops, wrong button. Refers to, it helps if I actually wear had everything going. There we go. Tin Pan Alley refers to two different things. It refers to a physical location in Tin Pan, in New York City, and this is a plaque. I'm pointing and you can't see me point. That's wonderful. This is a, um, a, a plaque at, at, in the, on the site in New York City where it's located at, where a whole bunch of publishing firms came together in this one block, and they for a couple of decades were the nexus of American popular music. And then Tin Pan Alley refers in general to an era of time that runs roughly from the late 18, from the early 1890s to the middle of the 1950s. The name of uh, Tin Pan Alley comes from this gentleman here, Monroe Rosenfeld. Um, he was a writer, a composer, uh, a gambler. He was a, 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 did a whole bunch of things. Um, as a composer, he wrote songs like uh, this song, Finnegan the Umpire. And he was talking with one day with Harry Von Teasler, who was a, another publisher and songwriter. Harry Von Teasler came to... Uh, um, fame as uh, writing a song called A Bird in a Gilded Cage. So when they're talking, uh, Von Teasler makes this comment about how his piano sounded tinny. And after uh, Monroe left him, he started thinking uh, that not only did his pi did Von Teasler's piano sound tinny, but every Tin Pan Alley shop he um, visited had a tinny sounding piano. So he sounded, to him it sounded like Tin Pan's being beaten upon. So that's where he came up with the name, and he wrote it in an article, um, what was believed to be lost, but somebody found it, and it's from the St. Louis Dispatch from 1903, and the title of it is Tin Pan Alley, why is it the place where the popular, popular songs come from? Now, in reality, he was, he was trying to um, um, be insulting to them because he hadn't been successful as a songwriter, but the insult failed because they loved it and adopted it as their nickname. So, um, so Tin Pan Alley is predicated on a particular concept, which is you have an audience that knows how to read music. Well, we're, we were a country of colonists, and 
reading music was not a prime skill for colonists. So when the first group of colonists came over, um, most of them were musically illiterate. Many of them were uh, mainly from churches and were coming from churches that eschewed instrumental music and, uh, and were into congregational singing. Um, so they may not have brought over the ability to read music, though they did bring some music with them. The oldest song in America that was probably sung was the doxology, the old 100. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Uh, so that is the, the first song that was probably sung in America. What ends up happening is that over the course of from early 1600s to the 1700s, there was only one style of singing going on for the most part called congregational singing or lining, which mean, lining means that the minister would recite the line and rap out a rhythm and then the congregation would repeat it. So he might sing, praise God from whom, and then the congregation would go, praise God from whom. And so you would get this, this type of singing. When we first started as colonies, we were a rural country. We, everybody was working on farms, very small communities. But by the early 1700s, we had, um, well, we might not call them cities in the fashion that we would call cities, but we had large communities where, that were in contact with Europe. And they started talking about the fact and started realizing that in Europe, the brethren of the churches sang from music. And so a controversy arose that's called the singing controversy. It was kicked off by a gentleman by the name of Cotton Mathers, who was a minister. Um, and he wrote, a, 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 well, he gave a sermon and then wrote a pamphlet about it, instructions on, the, on how to sing. And at the crux of his, of his comments was the concept that congregational singing lining was raucous and that it was not conducive to good um, good service and so he wanted to push for reading of music that became led into a real debate where we had the uh, people wanting to continue on in the old way that is in a com in the common fashion singing like their daddy's daddies did, and in a war, people pushing for the idea of singing from music. So we have a gentleman by the name of uh, Reverend Thomas Symes, and he wrote a pamphlet uh, that had a, 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 um, a Latin title, Util Dolce, uh, and then he, the English subtitle is A Jocko Serious Dialogue Concerning Regular Singing. Well, in this dialogue, he has a minister talking to a rural person, and it was this debate about how do you sing? Do you sing from uh, the way our daddy's daddies did it, or do we sing from music? Um, and he went through, the, the, the person who was rural was going, it costs money, it takes time, it detracts from the service, we have to learn a skill we don't need, and I'm fine with the way it is. Well, um, Reverend Thomas Symes started referring to people like this as anti-regular singers. And as ha what happens in any political movement or any type of movement, those phrases get uh, turned into acronym. And, so from, and he's a reverend, so from the pulpit, he started referring to people as arses. Anti-regular singers, arses. You, he must have been a very popular talker at the time. Um, so what ends up happening is that we start getting people publishing music psalms. And one of the first books published in America is a book called, uh, of music is called An Introduction to Psalm Tones by the Reverend John Tuck. So over the course, and this is in the early 1700s, this, uh, in fact, Re Reverend Symes writes his, his treatise in 1725. So over the, uh, what ends up happening over the next hundred, uh, uh, 60 to 70 years is the rise of singing schools where, and, uh, and traveling singing teachers. 
where they would come into a community, they would teach people how the rudiments of singing and leave these psalm hymnals with them. And over the course of, from the early 1700s to about the time of the Revolutionary War, there grew this idea that singing was essential, singing from music, being able to read music, was an essential function of being a cultured person uh, and being a good church person. This was mainly in the cities or and, and the larger communities. So what we get is the first real demonstration of the split between rural and urban people when it comes to music. The rural people were going, we're going to sing in the fashion that our, our fathers' fathers sang in, and the, the uh, urban people were wanting to sing from music and be much more progressive about it. So in the cities, cultured people to be a cultured person, you needed to be able to sing, and as, as the colonies became uh, much more self-sufficient and instruments started being introduced, being able to play an instrument became important. Uh, and that led to our first known composer. And, uh, oh, it would help if I would actually hit the right button. There we go. And his name is uh, William Billings. He lived from 1746 to 1800. He was actually a tanner before he became um, a, a musician. Um, and he opened up the first music shop with the sign above it saying, Ye Old Music Shop. And he published music and wrote music and published that music in books like this called The Psalm Singer's Amusement. Uh, and he had a concept of fuguing which is something, uh, fuguing, uh, fugue is something Bach wrote. He didn't understand what a fugue was, so what he did was called fuguing, but it's not the same as Bach. Uh, the interesting thing about him is that by the time of the Revolutionary War, in a time when there is no, in a time when there is no mass media, uh, communication is very limited, he was known throughout the colonies. So he's our first popular composer. And one of the songs he wrote, it was called Chester, and I'm going to uh, give you an example of it right now, of, of the first piece of popular music in America. Now his uh, music has, uh, his popular music has fallen uh, out of favor. Uh, very few people know him, unless you're a church musician, because some of his hymns, because he also wrote hymns, <clears throat> excuse me, still show up in hymnals. So as I was saying, we get this culture in the, basically in the New England and mid-Atlantic states, uh, maybe up and down the Atlantic states, where people, uh, if they are to truly be cultured is to learn how to be able to sing and play instruments. And it leads to a musical culture that we refer to as the genteel culture. This was a culture based on the idea of performing music at home. Here's a picture from the early seven, uh, from the early, uh, a drawing from the early 1800s. And here's a, a photo from the late 1880s of a family gathered around a piano. 
So the idea of the genteel culture was self-entertainment, uh, and the music had to be uh, of home, hearth, religion, purity. It was uh, cultured, it was reserved, um, it was chaste. So there was no controversy, no sexual references. It was all about clean music. And so this is a culture that the publishers were in on the East Coast and, uh, and, and the New England region were aiming their music for. So they would publish music mainly of European uh, uh, composers. So they would get the latest music from uh, London and Paris and they would print it up. Um, of the radical, in the early uh, 1800s would be of those radical composers like Beethoven uh, and, and Schubert. Um, and, and then as the century went on, they would be using that type of music. Plus they did a little bit of homegrown music, but it was more along the lines that they didn't promote the music. Uh, it was just they would publish the music and people would buy it. This was the one style of music that was going on in, in, on the East Coast. Now another style of music showed up in the Midwest and publishers, and it was a whole different style of music. Uh, it was cruder, uh, it was sexually oriented, it was rude, it had um, bad jokes in it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we're talking about the rise of blackface and the minstrel shows. This starts with a gentleman by the name of Thomas Daddy Rice. Uh, he was a performer who traveled around the Midwest, Kentucky, Illinois, down to Missouri, that type of region. And he's performing in the theaters, that, a lot of times in makeshift theaters and all that. But he's looking, um, like any performer, he's looking for a hook. How do you catch the audience's attention? And he's competing with everybody else. So he tells a story that, depending on which community he is in, he says, well, I was in this community, I saw this stable hand. And the story he tells, and the city changes, but the basic story he told was that he watched the stable hand, a black stable hand, who was in tattered clothes, washing, um, brushing down horses in a stable. And between brushing horses, he would do this dance and, and mutter, jumping Jim Crow. And so, Tom, uh, Tom, Thomas Daddy Rice created the figure of Jim Crow. And that figure, he's on the left. This is a drawing of him on the left. On the right is how it got turned into a piece of sheet music. Now, blackface involves putting cork, black, blackening, a, uh, burning a cork, using uh, ham fat to put the black on your face. It is not new. It is something that goes back to theater in Europe. For example, in Elizabethan England, how do you have a black moor in the Virgin of Venice for Shakespeare? So they use cork then. Uh, so blackface was not new as a theater, uh, style of theater, but the way the Americans put a spin on it is the whole, a whole different thing. As a side note, because they used ham fat to hold the cork down, which was pretty messy, the fr if you acted up on stage, it was called hamming it up. That's where the phrase hamming it up comes from. So uh, we get this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we get this blackface and uh, it became popular. Even though Thomas, uh, um, da Thomas Daddy Rice was going, uh, look, this is my, my thing, you really don't need to do it. It became very popular among performers. Um, performers like any type of hook, and if they see somebody else doing it and it's successful, they'll jump on it. We, we're basically monkeys, we imitate other people. I'm a performer, I can get away with saying that. So we come to, uh, excuse me, we come to Dan Emmett, who it creates the first minstrel show uh, excuse me, the minstrel troupe, and the minstrel troupe was called the Virginia Minstrels. And it is the ideal of taking a group of black-faced performers, and instead of competing with each other to get the theater's attention, which is what they were doing, they decided to work together as a group and present a whole evening's entertainment. So that is the rise of the black-faced uh, minstrel shows. 
because they were constantly performing and touring before an audience, they always needed new music. And so we see a series of covers like this of blackface uh, music or uh, music written for the minstrel shows featuring blackface uh, uh, caricatures on the covers. And so essentially what the minstrel show do is they layer into America the stereotypes of black people. For example, Jim Crow, it's no, it's no small coincidence that the segregation laws of the South are called Jim Crow laws. Uh, they are uh, based, uh, that was the figure they were on. The character Jim Dandy is another example that comes from this. The ideal of the piccanini, the ideal of, of, of water, black seeding watermelon, of being scared. And these are what lead into the, the, the uh, logos of Uncle Ben and Jemima, Sambo. These are all stem from the blackface tradition. We then come to uh, Edwin Pierce Christie, uh, E.P. Christie, who does the new, or who does the Christie minstrels, not the new Christie minstrels from the folk period. Uh, he does a lot to, to establish what a, a minstrel show is, but more importantly, he establishes a musical relationship with our first well-known popular composer, Stephen Collins. Uh, and uh, Stephen Foster, excuse me. So the, the, with Foster, Foster was uh, our, what we consider our first professional songwriter. He was not a performer per se. Uh, he did perform as a, ki a, a child, but as he grew older, he realized he didn't want to perform. He just wanted to write songs. And so he becomes our first songwriter. And he's writing music uh, of a variety of styles of music. And so now he um, um, becomes a, an example of the, the thread that composers had to uh, thread here, which is the, the conundrum they had to thread, which is you have two different distinct audiences in America at this point. You have the blackface audience, which uh, minstrel shows, which was crude, sexually oriented music, uh, uh, very suggestive lyrics, crude humor, performing live, and then you had the genteel culture, which was at home. And so he writes two different styles of music trying to um, come up with a balance. On the one hand, he's doing Beautiful Dreamer, which is a sentimental ballad that, that would appeal to the, the genteel culture of New England. And on the right is Camp Town Races, where he is writing music for uh, the, the minstrel shows. And in fact, um, Christie had a contract with uh, Stephen Foster that he got to put his name on the music. Christie got to put his name on the music as the composer. So Stephen Foster is ghostwriting the song. So sometimes you will see songs that are definitely Stephen Foster, but you'll see Christie's name underneath it. So here's a little bit of some music that was very popular music in America in the early 1800s, around the 1830s, 40s. Sing this song, do da, do da. The came to race back by my long, holy do da day. I went down there when my hat came in, do da, do da. I come back home with a pot full of tin, holy do da day. One run all night, one run all day. I'll bet my money on the bobtail nag, somebody been on the bay. Now, on 
on the issue of suggestive, suggestiveness of the songs. We all sang Camp Town Races as kids. Camp Town Races were an actual set of races that occurred near uh, a place where Stephen Foster was living. The races were not quite legal. Um, and so camp, the Camp Town lady she's talking about are prostitutes. And they would hang out underneath the bleachers and around where the, 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 the uh, race fans were. And their come on to the, to the customers was doodah. So when you're singing that song, you're asking for a customer to come in and buy your services. Think about that the next time you hear a child sing that song that they learned in school. So this gives you the, the, the range between the genteel culture and the minstrel culture. And it is the root of the culture wars that we talk about in the entertainment industry. Because so the genteel culture is going, we want clean, wholesome music like our parents used to sing, and we abhor this, this filth and degradation coming from entertainers. And the entertainers are going, who cares? We're making money. <laughs> the usual response from an entertainer. So uh, that so the so when we talk when we have the culture wars that are going on and people criticize Hollywood and all that, this goes all the way back to the 1830s and 40s, and that's the start of our culture wars. Uh, also, what Stephen Foster shows is what's going on in the music industry at the time. The publishers bought the song from the composer for like 15, 20, 25 dollars. Now that's a lot of money at the time, but they got no other money after that and the, the publishers could sell it and make 100, 200 dollars off of it and not share any of the profits with the composer. So in this period of time, composers, songwriters were at the mercy of the, uh, of the publishers. Uh, and the publishers took advantage of them. <clears throat> this kind of leads us, so the minstrel shows, they're the lo longest, almost the longest running form of music in America. They, if we start with Thomas Daddy Rice in the early 1830s, they go all the way to the late, the, or to the early 1930s as a popular form with Al Jolson being the last major blackface performer. And as a side note, what is very interesting is that there were black artists after the Civil War, when they participated in entertainment, they blackened their face because it was considered de rigueur for performers to be on stage with blackface, even if you were already black. Now, interestingly enough, there was a, a late blackface performer whose next stage name was Pigmeat Martin, and he loved blackface because he had a very dark complexion, and he was able to lighten up by blackening up. My, so he liked that aspect. So the minstrel shows begin the idea of being able to tour around the country, and that leads to the rise of vaudeville, which is, and the touring circuits. The touring circuits, um, here are a couple, oh, excuse me help if I stayed on the picture I wanted to be on. Uh, here are a couple of pictures of uh, early vaudeville shows. Uh, on the left is, a, is a, um, a theater in New York City where the show was five cents and what they meant by continuous vaudeville is that the theater would open like at nine or ten in the morning and wouldn't close until eleven or twelve at night. So the performers would be constantly performing on stage all day long. Now that doesn't mean a performer's there performing all eleven hours, but they may do an act, their act at nine o'clock, eleven o'clock, one o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock. They were there. I mean, we're talking about a very abusive system. On the right is a later theater, is uh, our, our, uh, the Keith's Orpheum Theater. By the time this, Keith, Keith was a big touring circuit. Um, the Keith touring circuit was probably the biggest touring circuit. And he is, um, was a tyrant. If you performed in his theater, well, let, let me back up. Uh, when you performed in a vaudeville show, you performed for a week and then you moved on to another theater. His theater in New York was the prime theater. You would do a run-through on Monday, 
And he would watch the show, and if he didn't like any particular material in your show, he would write a note, give it to him, put it in an envelope, give it to his minions to deliver, and uh, it was in a blue envelope put in underneath the door of the performer. And that is where the phrase blue material comes from, because usually he would cut, have them cut overly suggestive material. Because at this point, vaudeville was trying to negotiate the distance between the minstrel shows, which were very crude and sexually oriented, and the genteel culture. Vaudeville was actually an attempt to be family-oriented entertainment. And so vaudeville became very big, and it filled all of the United States. And we get these wonderful posters of vaudeville, uh, bright enough to date new acts, uh, oh, it would help if I actually showed you the picture. There we go. Uh, vaudeville acts, new customers and new costumes and new sceneries. The posters were quite colorful at this period of time. Now, how this plays into music is very important. Because they were doing seasons and they were always performing and touring and performing coming back to the same place, they wanted new music all the time. And so they were going to the publishers and asking for music. And this led to this very interesting dynamic here of uh, this pyramid. You had the publishers. Um, they would have the music. The performer would come to the publisher and purchase a, or find a piece of music that they wanted to perform, and then come back to, uh, to the, and perform it for the audience. The audience would love it and go buy, or, uh, and buy it from the publisher. And the publisher sat between all the performer and the audience and the songwriters. So the publisher is in the catbird seat, as it were. They reap all the profits. They are controlling the flow of music to the entertainer in the audience that comes from the, uh, 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 from the uh, songwriters. So the music business at this point is divided into two basic camps. We've got the music, or I shouldn't say two basic camps. They have two basic audiences. But for the most part, publishers from this period of time weren't doing much to push their music. If the performer bought the music and the audience loved it, that was fine. Uh, and then that all changes. And that changes when we get to this gentleman here, Charles K. Harris. He writes a song called After the Ball. And it is written and published in 1892. And it becomes the first million selling piece of sheet music. Now, usually a piece of sheet music may sell 50,000 to 100,000. A really good sale would be 250,000. A million was phenomenal. So that's like gold record status today. Um, and I actually have found a video clip of Charles K. Harris. Uh, we think this comes from roughly 1928-29 because he dies in 1930. Here he is performing after the ball. Uh, 
da A couple of things about that song. We think of the eight, or we think of the 1890s. 1890s are referred to as the gay 90s. Yet the popular music of that period were sad, sentimental ballads, like After the Ball, A Bird in a Gilded Cage. Uh, it's very interesting. So the period may have been happy, but the music wasn't happy. And there's a couple of interesting things about this song. This is a story song, and the, the part that most of us remember about the song is the chorus, After the Ball. The story is about a, a gentleman who's never married. This girl, little girl climbs up on his lap and asks him about it. And the story he tells is that he was engaged and he comes and he goes, to, they're at a party, a dance. He goes to get a drink and he comes back and he sees the woman that he loves uh, kissing a man like lovers. And he run, drops the, the drink and runs out and leaves and abandons her. And then later on in life, he learns that that wasn't a lover, it was her brother. Now this is a weird story if you think about it. First of all, in our current climate, the idea of a little girl climbing on a, an old man's lap, child abuse bells ring all over her head. But the idea that a sister would be kissing his, her brother like a lover is a pretty bizarre concept also. So the, there's some real sickness in some of these songs. Uh, 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 there were songs during this period of time, these sentimental ballads of the, eight, of the early part of the Tin Pan Alley era, where things like um, you get a child going bar to bar looking for her drunken father. Where is my father? You know, that is pretty pathetic. Um, but what we see going on with the rise of the early Tin Pan Alley music um, is suddenly with this hit song, A Million Sellers, everybody's going, there's money in music publishing. And also remember, this is the era of the robber barons. And so what we get out of the early music publishers is the music equivalent of robber barons. They were raiding each other's uh, um, uh, writers, songwriters, let me back up. So the model would be, you would be a publisher, you would set up a publishing firm, and then you would hire writers to write music for you. Uh, and I love the quote from Isidore Whitmark, who's from the publishing company Whitmark and Sons. Uh, their father set up the business for them because they were underage. But what it, the quote from Isidore Whitmark was, we knew about as much about music as we knew about publishing, nothing. So a lot of the early publishers, this was a startup business. A lot of people flooded into it because it was a new business where they could generate lots of income cheaply. And it had a ready-made audience because people were, were crying out for the music. Uh, and so you would hire a staff of composers. Uh, you would put, you, uh -huh. And what ended up happening, you would have these cubicles where you would actually have the writer in the cubicle with us, a, a lyricist, and they would be working eight hours a day or more as a job to turn out songs. So what ends up happening is Tin Pan Alley changes music from being an art form to a commodity. And it's more about how many units of music you could sell rather than the quality of the music. So they were turning out thousands and thousands of tunes and selling them uh, all across the country. And that becomes the interesting thing. The music industry was centered in New York, and there are a few publishers elsewhere, but most of the publishers congregated in New York, and everybody starts looking to New York for music. And so New York becomes the center of the music publishing industry. Uh, and because they are, the way they wrote music, they started influencing cu culture. So when planes, ought, when the planes showed up, they started writing songs about planes. When the car showed up, they started writing songs about the car. When there was some sort of action or event, they would write songs about it. 
uh, there were songs about uh, the Spanish-American War. There were, when we get to the Lusitania, there's songs about the Lusitania. There's all sorts of music based around events churned out by these composers. Uh, and also, if somebody had a hit song using the word spoon, they would jump on it and write a whole bunch of songs trying to figure out how to do spoon or fork or knife or anything else like that. So it became a very imitative form of, of, uh, of, of entertainment. So the, basically what ends up happening is we see music going from, like I said, from being an art form to a commodity to being debased into, well, we'll put out anything and the audience will buy it. And the audience did. What helped spur on Tin Pan Alley at this point is that America had urbanized. Between the 1880s and the 1920s, we went from being a rural agricultural nation to an urban nation with factory workers, shopkeepers, and large cities. And that meant people had lots of money and they, and they were, and lots of, well, a relative of that large amount of free time, and they were looking for entertainment. Along with that was the fact that pianos, violins, guitars, and weird instruments like mandolin guitars, harp guitars, and bizarre instruments that, that no longer exist were being manufactured and people were buying them up. And so because there was no other entertainment going on, people turned to Tin Pan Alley to buy the music so they could entertain themselves at home. And so entertainment blossoms in, uh, um, the uh, Tin Pan Alley rides upon this aspect uh, of culture that was going on. And they started becoming very creative in the way they promoted the music. Uh, there's something called song plugging. The earliest form of song plugging was to, if you had a performer who was popular, you would put their picture on the cover to uh, to stroke their ego and then people would see it was being sung by this person and they would buy that music because they liked that performer. Then it started progressing to, well, we will pay the performer to sing this song. That was perfectly acceptable in the 1890s, but in the 1950s when the record companies paid DJs to pay, play the records, that became the payola scandals, which took down numerous DJs uh, during that period of time. But song plugging became even more creative. Um, many of us remember the five and ten dime stores like Woolworths. And song pluggers, a form of song plugging was you would hire a pianist to go into a store. They would have beside a pian, um, excuse me, you would have a pianist, a singer. They would go into the store. The store would have a piano and a rack of music beside uh, the the uh, piano of that publishing firm's music, and you would play the songs to entertain the uh, uh, people and hopefully buy them. Jerome Kern, the early part of his career, was doing that as a song uh, playing uh, music at, uh, <clears throat> of his publisher at a 5 and 10 store. Um, he also was so much into playing piano and playing popular music that when some of the other publishers didn't, uh, song people didn't show up, he'd start playing their music. His publisher wasn't too thrilled about that, but that was Jerome Kern. Then another form of song plugging was to put a performer in the audience and when a, when a particular song was sung from the stage to act like you were so moved by the song that you would stand up and sing the song back spontaneously from the audience. Irving Berlin as a child did that in uh, 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 for uh, a couple of publishers. Uh, and so he would sit there, wait for the song to come on, and then he would get up and sing the song. After a while, people would got caught on to that, and they would be looking around the audience to see who would be the person to stand up and do the singing at that time. So, so, so Tin Pan Alley created this incredible uh, uh, industry that just roared along selling million selling songs after million, million selling songs. And it also powered, uh, helped foster music like ragtime. A lot of us think of ragtime as piano music, but the original form of ragtime was singing. 
Uh, and so you got people like uh, Ben Harney, who was a, uh, a, a was quoted as saying he had a fine Negro voice, though he was white, and he would be singing songs that were, quote, Negro of sorts, and that became the beginning of ragtime in New York City in 1893. Now, Scott, we, we think of Scott Joplin and Maple Leaf Rag. That doesn't come around until 1899. The piano form of ragtime is a late form of ragtime. If you were to go to the, on the streets of New York City in 1890 and ask somebody what uh, ragtime was, they would tell you it was, hello, my baby, hello, my honey. They, they would say singing songs rather than piano songs. So what ends up happening between 1890 and the 1940s is that Tin Pan Alley becomes the center of music publishing, which meant it was the center of all the popular songs and also of musical theater, because musical theater was there in New York City. And in fact, part of the reason why musical theater takes off in New York is because publishers are there. And so the song writing teams of, of um, Ira and George Gershwin, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, Jerome Kern, they were all part of Tin Pan Alley. In fact, we talk about the music of Tin Pan Alley in a collective term called the Great American Songbook. Uh, so when you hear Willie Nelson singing from the Great American Songbook, the music he's singing from is drawn from the Tin Pan Alley composers. And all these composers had a love-hate relationship with their publishers, um, basically because they were at the mercy of the publishers. Uh, if the publisher didn't like their song, it didn't get uh, printed. If the publisher did like their song, they didn't get as much money from it as they would have liked to have gotten from it, at least initially. In the next half, we'll get into how that changes. So when we start talking about American culture uh, during the 1890s to the 1940s, we are talking Tin Pan Alley as the dominant form. Summertime, uh, over the rainbow. Uh, uh, now suddenly I'm spacing on all these songs that I play all the time. Anything by Jerome Curd, uh, On the Sunny Side of the Street. Uh, those are all Tin Pan Alley songs. When you went to see a musicals, in uh, movie musicals, when Hollywood needed music, they got, they turned to hot, they turned to broad, uh, to Tin Pan Alley. So Broadway became Hollywood, and so Jerome Kern, Irving Berlin, uh, all those guys went to Hollywood, and they took Tin Pan Alley with them. So the culture, and also the big band composers, as they started publishing their music, they published through the Tin Pan Alley uh, composers, uh, pro, uh, publishers. So the music of Betty Goodman that he wrote, uh, and he wrote a few songs, or the music of Artie Shaw, of Glenn Miller, any of those guys who wrote songs, they were, they were published by Tin Pan Alley composers. Conversely, the popular songs that they performed were performed by Tin Pan Alley, uh, were from Tin Pan Alley. So we can really talk about the ninth, from 1990 to 1940 as the era of Tin Pan Alley in our culture, all across the spectrum. Um, and at this point, my bladder is calling to let off all the coffee that I've consumed. So let us take a break and we'll come back. There are no other questions. Um, I shall proceed from here. So, um, I got to, oh, now I got to make sure thing, everything's set up again. Here we go. So this is an article called The Menace of Mechanical Music written by John Philip Sousa. Shows up in Appleton Magazine in 1906. And in it, he's expressing the article itself, the, ba the, basic, asp the um, basic content of the article is that he is upset with music because it's gonna replace live music. And he has all these images like a uh, uh, 
some guy serenading his girlfriend. She's up in the balcony, and instead of holding a guitar, he's got a gramophone and he's singing along with it. Or the idea uh, of a baby in a in a, um, a cradle being rocked by a mechanical arm with a gramophone playing. Our children will be rocked to sleep by machines. He predicted the mobiles over our bassinets. You know, so the the basis of that article was about the dangers of record to live music. And it was a real threat. You can see this is from another, uh, this is a newspaper article that picks, oops, this is, come on, this is from a newspaper article, Music Machines May Kill Music. Sousa sees grave menace to the heavenly maid in the rise of the automobiles. I love how heavenly maid is a woman rather than M-A-D-E. Uh, <laughs> So at this time, John Philip Sousa is the, probably the most important musician in the United States, the most popular musician. He's, in fact, the most well-known mus American musician around the world. He has just done a couple of world tours. Um, and so he is seen as the elder spokesman for music. But in reality, his argument against records had nothing to do with its impact on live music. Uh, in truth, he, I mean, he loathed records in, in, in one respect, um, and he's the one that coined the term canned music. But a good chunk of his career was predicated on the 400 Edison recordings that Edison made of him. But he, he was at least pure to his belief in, in not wanting to be involved in records. Almost none of those records does he conduct the band himself. He has his second in command, uh, and, and most of the time that would have been Arthur Pryor conducting it. So it's the John Philip Sousa band playing John Philip Sousa's music, but it would probably more likely be Arthur Pryor conducting. The real issue for Sousa was not that it took away from live music, but that a band, brass band could take the music that they bought from a publisher, perform it on a record, and sell those records, and he wouldn't get a cent. Enough, and he was expressing a fear that was central to Tin Pan Alley, because mechanical music, uh, the way mechanical music was being handled, was a threat to printed music. The whole idea of printed music is a commodity. You're selling numerous copies. Suddenly people could be doing records and those records could be sold without you getting a cent. And so what we are talking about is people seeing their copyrights and copyrights didn't exist at this time. Well, we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, so that's a central issue. And realize, here's one of the pictures from that uh, article help by changing the picture. And you can see it's a gramophone next to the mechanism of a player piano. And in fact, that is a mechanism for a retrofit that you could put in front of a piano that was not a player piano, and it would act like a player piano. So mechanical music just did not mean records. It meant mechanical instruments like player pianos. I have seen, uh, I had a friend of my, excuse me, a friend of my father's had a mechanical violin that could play a couple of dozen tunes. Uh, I've seen mechanical guitars from this era. And then not only that, uh, and so, and player pianos were being sold in huge numbers in this period of time. Um, there are also music boxes. Now we think of music boxes as these little toys you lift up and it plays Somewhere My Love. These were full-blown record players, only their records were metal discs that, that did what those little music box did. Uh, and uh, so they, these mechanical music was seen as an existential threat to music publishing because it was taking money directly from them as far as they were concerned. Now, copyrights did exist in the United States. And in fact, uh, they, the concept of copyrights shows up in the Constitution, it's specifically mentioned in the Constitution. And the first piece of music published in America under a United States copyright is a tune called the Kentucky Volunteer. It's published on January 6, 1794. So yes, it was copyrighted, but the, the, it, the copyright in the Constitution does not explicitly state music. There is a, a if I remember correctly, in the early set, uh, excuse me, the late 1700s, oh no, early 1800s, there was a revi revising of the copyright laws. 
uh, that stated thing that music was uh, explicitly stated. But here was the problem. There was no enforcement mechanism. Remember I talked about the fact that the publishers uh, in the 1800s, a lot of the publishers for the genteel audience were publishing European music. They were not paying any money for it. They were pirating it. To use a current term, they were stealing intellectual property rights. So the very, I find this very ironic, the very thing that we are accusing the Chinese and other Asian nations of doing, that is theft of our intellectual property rights, we did to the Europeans hardcore in the 1800s when it came to music. So any music that you find printed in America in the 1800s, there's a Beethoven, of Mozart, of any, of, or of any European music, dollars to donuts, it was pirated music. So just as a side note here. Uh, and in fact, it got so bad that this is Gilbert and Sullivan. They came and premiered their musical Pirates of Penzan in the United States because they wanted to make sure that at least the initial performances in the United States got money because their hit HMS Pinafore was a hit in the United States with over in, in New York City in 1869 having, uh, excuse me, 1878, uh, having uh, over two dozen different versions of, of uh, HMS Pinafore, including this one, come on, move on to the next slide, this one done in Phil, uh, the Philadelphia Church Choir I don't know why the Philadelphia Church Choir is performing a, a, a HMS Pinafore, and they're performing in New York. And here's a side note. It's under the direction of John Philip Sousa, because before he becomes the March King, he's a musical theater person. Just as a side note, Sousa's instrument, first instrument, is a violin. So we've got this violinist writing March music. Anyway, so... Uh, the issue becomes in America that copyright, sure you had a copyright, nobody was enforcing it. And so when we get to the 1890s and uh, Tin, Pali, Tin Pan Alley explodes, they figured at first all the sales of music was fine. Copyright, we, we'll copyright the music just to be legal, but you know, we've got money coming in. And when the phonograph first showed up, they didn't see it as a threat. In fact, they saw it as another form of song plugging. You will find that, the, or more probably, they, especially when the flat disc came out as opposed to the cylinders, you'll sometimes find records from the 1890s that only has music on one side because they were using it not as a, a record to sell the music, but as an advertisement. So if you came into, the, into a music publishing house, they didn't need a pianist playing uh, a piano and singing the song. They could just slap a record on, get rid of an employee. Automation striking and dealing, taking away jobs. It starts even earlier than you think. So by, but when the mechanical music takes off in the 1890s and the 1900s and records really roar into success, Tin Pan Alley was facing a crisis because they're going, we're hemorrhaging money. You get a piano, somebody takes that music, puts it on a piano roll, we don't get any money from it. Somebody puts it on, on a, a disc for a, 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 a music box, we don't get any money for it. Records, the same thing. And so what ends up happening is we get this gentleman here. His name is Victor Herbert. He's, he wrote the uh, Naughty Marietta, where we get When I'm Calling You, the big song of Nelson Eddy, Jet Manette McDonald. He also wrote Babes in Toyland. Very successful musical theater person at this time. Um, and he um, leads the charge uh, in front of Congress. Uh, he's, a, he's a, well, let me back up. He becomes a big advocate for the rights of composers and publishers, specifically the composer, because he's a composer, not a publisher, to protect intellectual property rights. So he teams up with um, John Philip Sousa, and the two of them proceed to lobby Congress in 1909 uh, to uh, 1908, 1909 to change the copyright laws. Uh, and they are excess, very successful in changing copyright laws. 
And what they do is not only secure um, the intellectual property right, a copyright for intellectual property rights, they secure four different aspects, uh, revenue streams that are associated with a published piece of music. The first one is songwriters rights. In other words, if I write a piece of music, I own that music, it's mine. I mean, that's a basic one but they made sure it was explicitly stated in the law. The second one is that as a composer or the owner of the copyright, and then we'll get into what that means in a moment, that I have performance rights. I can control who can perform the music within reason. It, um, so when you see these arguments between uh, political candidates playing music of a performer, there is solid grounds for a performer to say, hey, I don't want you playing my song. Uh, and it comes out of the 1906 copyright laws. The third one is publishing rights. That is, uh, if you publish the piece of music, you have all the rights that are included in that published music, including songwriters rights and performance rights. But the key one is mechanical rights that any device that can reproduce the music is included in as part of the, the copyright. And that extension is paramount to the creation of the music industry. Now that's all in the weeds and I, and I realize that's all in the weeds and yet that is the basis of how you generate income. And that's what turns the, mus the music business transforms the music business into the music industry. Without that protection, the music business would have just been printing music and would have probably been having to compete with the fact, if it could compete for very long, with these mechanical devices stealing their money, as far as they were concerned. So they would have been starved of revenues and, and Tin Pan Alley as we knew it would have never have existed. So we go back to uh, Victor Herbert and we talk about this copyright law. You've got the copyright law. How do you enforce it? What is the enforcement mechanism? So it's fine and dandy to be able to say, well, under the copyright laws, you have these four rights to these four revenue streams. How do you secure it? Well, the answer was, well, we'll go for this apocryphal story. This, and all, this also still revolves around Victor Herbert. Victor Herbert, is known for his music, but in the music industry, he is very important for the establishment of the music industry. So there's an, a, a story that revolves around him and Puccini. Puccini is in the United States for the premiere of his opera, Girls of the Golden West. And he's in the United States for the same reason Gilbert and Sullivan were for in the United States. He wanted to make sure that the initial performances of Girls of the Golden West the money came to him and because of the fact that the, the copyright laws were so vague. So supposedly, Victor Her so supposedly, Victor Herbert and Puccini are out to dinner somewhere. They're drinking and having fun. And some paratone just sings a song, who's entertaining the audience, sings a song from one of Puccini's operas. And Puccini supposedly turns to Victor Herbert and says, how much money did I just make? And Victor Herbert supposedly goes, huh, what do you mean? And Puccini says, well, in Europe, we have a performance rights organization that collects money. Well, that story is apocryphal. And the reason for it being apocryphal is that Victor Herbert is a European trained musician. He grew up in Europe and doesn't come to America until he's in his 20s. And so he, ought, and he worked with Liszt, he worked with Brahms, he knows the system, he has connections with the Europeans. So this is not a new concept for him. But what he does is he takes that concept, and the concept is if you are an, an establishment, a theater, a restaurant, uh, and you're, you're generating income and you have a performer uh, do a song that you own the copyright to, that venue owes you money. And so what he does is he teams up with his old stalwart, John Philip Stuza, and now Irving Berlin, because Irving Berlin, this is 1914, Irving Berlin has become the big composer. In 1911, he does Swanee, uh, which is his uh, big hit with Al Jolson. 
uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and they form an organization called ASCAP, the American Society of Authors, Composer of, of Composers, Authors, and uh, Publishers. This is what we call the performance rights organization. They collect the money. Uh, you join that organization, and this organization will monitor variety of, of uh, facilities um, and will then go to that facility and collect the revenues for you. ASCAP featured not just uh, the founders of ASCAP were not just those three men, but Jerome Kern is involved, Rudolf Frimmel is involved, and then several major publishers are involved. They form the organization and then they go to various restaurants and theaters in the area and start saying, you are performing music of members of our organization. You owe us money for this. And of course, people are going, this sounds like a shakedown. We're not going to pay you any money. And so Victor Herbert uh, uses his knowledge of the copyright laws to take them to court and it makes it all the way to, to the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court is sitting Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, and he writes uh, this in his opinion in the court case called Herbert versus Stanley and Company. And basically, oh, it would probably help if I stayed on and showed you the picture. There we go. This is Oliver Wendell Holmes. I, it must have been fun me just pointing to something that's not there. And this is of his article. If music did not pay, it would be given up. Whether it pays or not, the purpose of employing it, it's profit, and that is enough. So it doesn't matter that you're not charging for the, the patron of a restaurant to hear the cocktail pianist play the latest hits. The fact that you are having music there is there to enhance the environment and thus enhance your revenues, therefore, you owe the people uh, who own the copyright money for performing that. And that becomes the basis of ASCAP. And that's what makes the music industry profitable. To give you an idea of how profitable it is, last year, 2019, ASCAP generated $1.275 billion, that's with a B, dollars. Just ASCAP. BMI about the same amount. And that's just the royalty performance royalty organization. So we're talking almost two and a half billion dollars between just those two in, in, uh, institutions. And the money in the music industry is not in the initial sale of records or in the initial sale of sheet music. It's in all this aftermarket stuff. It is in performing of, <coughs> excuse me, it is in people performing your music in theaters. It's people performing your music in restaurants. And when radio came into existence, the radio tried to say, well, look, we are not a live establishment. We, we are not using live performers. We paid for the records. So the music does that we play over the radio doesn't need to have pay any fees to copyrights. And of course, they were taken to court and the courts ruled that no, you do have to apply that. They actually went to Congress, that is the radio stations tried to go to Congress to get an exemption in the copyright law and Irving Berlin and uh, vociferously fought against it by the, this in the mid twenties. Uh, by this time, uh, uh, Sousa is involved, but by this time Victor Herbert has died. So they fought it out in Congress, and so radio was told that they had to pay for it. So every time you hear a piece of music on the, on the radio, you are you are hearing money being generated for somebody's holding of a copyright. Now I mentioned uh, who holds the copyright. The thing about rights, copyrights, is they can be transferred. And so a lot of times uh, publishers will demand publishing rights and mechanical rights. They'll give you songwriting rights. They'll give you performance rights, but they want the mechanical rights and they want the publishing rights because that's where a lot of the money is. And a lot of performers and composers sign those away. So 
this leads to the a very interesting question. Who, uh, uh, and of course, this question has become moot, but for a long time, who owned the Beatles catalog? It wasn't any of the Beatles. When Apple dissolved, Michael Jackson bought up the Beatle collection. And for a while, every time you were hearing a Beatles song, money was going into Michael Jackson's publishing firms because he owned the Beatles collection. That's how, that's what, why these are so important. These performance rights generate the very revenue and people fight over them. There are court battles over who owns the copyright to a song. Conversely, the copyright laws have been perverted every time um, the initial copyright laws were you got a copyright for 28 years with an extension of another 28 years. It varies on that's for published music, uh, for published music. It varies for, for like logos and stuff, but they're basically the same. There was a set period and a renewal period. Every time they have renewed the copyright laws, they have grandfathered in old businesses. So there is music that should be in the public domain that is not. Mickey Mouse should be in the public domain. Uh, Rhapsody in Blue should be in the public domain. Yet Rhapsody Blue is still held by the Gershwin family and about 10 years ago, it generated a half a million dollars worth of revenue for the Gershwin estate, that one song. So this is, these are why these rights are so important. And this is the basis of Tin Pan Alley and Ask Apis's performance arm. So what that means for you as the audience is that from the, eight, from the 1920s to the 1940s, Every, almost every piece of music you heard from a big band, every piece of music going into musical theater, every piece of music showing up on a record, for the most part, came from Tin Pan Alley, except for rural music. The rural divide is still at hardcore, and it's right there in the way music business was done. And why? Because rural folk didn't read music. Country, what we call country music was called hillbilly music, and it was screened out. Hillbilly music was a derogatory term. It was, it was that hill music that those crazy people sing. Black music, for the most part. Jazz was a different story, because most of the jazz artists were on records, and, and they, got, they got through the copyrights of records. But when you had blue, um, blues, most of the blues artists and, uh, and, those, and those type of artists did not read music. So they were not in, um, and I should put in this point, ASCAP was very adamant that the only way you could uh, secure a copyright is if you could write the music down and it could be in a printed format. So these artists were screened out, and that's why we get race music and hillbilly music. We'll get into how, why that changes in a bit. So from, uh, so man, you were listening, uh, there were issues, though, in how copyrights were handled, performance rights were handled with uh, black artists. Sure, you got performance rights uh, and credit as a songwriter, but a lot of times publishing firms would not, uh, and, then, and let me give you the example. Jelly Roll Morton, who was a jazz pian black jazz pianist, uh, was with Melrose Brothers, and Melrose Brothers said, we'll take care of the copyrights for you. And he got some money as, a, as the songwriter and all that, but they, ne they, because he was not a member of ASCAP, they didn't enforce the performance, for, uh, the mechanical rights for him or any of those gener revenue generating things. They let it come to themselves. So black artists uh, in, in the jazz world were screened out because of the way the publishing firms dealt with them. So the rev there, there's uh, revenue inequality here. There was also problems with inside ASCAP. As ASCAP grew, the leadership were older composers who had been around for a while, but their songs were not the music that was getting uh, performed out in the audience. Uh, yet, it seemed all the revenues seemed to go to the older people rather than to the younger, uh, newer artists. So there was 
uh, there have been several different controversies inside of ASCAP where publishers and uh, had to fight with their own composers and younger publishers had to fight with older publishers over how the, the equitable distribution of, of revenue. And that played out in how you, what type of music you heard. Uh, so they would, they would fight with each other and say, well, you're, if, you're, if you are published with that firm, we won't record you. And if you're, public, if you're with that firm, we will record you. So the music you heard sometimes was predicated on a record label was predicated on who the publishers were. And then you would get situations with like Erwin uh, Mills. You will see lots of music where he is listed as a composer, one of them being Duke Ellington. He didn't write a single note of any of the Duke Ellington tunes, but because he wanted to be, um, because he was the publisher, he demanded a portion of the songwriter's right, and, by, and the way to do that was to be included in the list of composers on the songs. So you will see uh, dozens of songs that have Erwin Mills' name on it. He has nothing to do with the song. This is all playing on the mechanism of, of the enforcement laws of ASCAP. So there's all this stuff going on behind the scenes in the industry that you don't see but play out hardcore in the type of music you actually heard. Now, I mentioned radio. ASCAP and radio were at war from the very beginning. And ASCAP started out by, uh, finally, when the copyrights were settled, they said, well, we want five cents per performance of a song. Well, that's a fair amount of money. But th that was the, the basis that they, they set it on. But over the course of the decade, from roughly 1930 to 1940, ASCAP got greedy and kept raising the rates. And because radio was becoming more popular, a lot of their artists, uh, were, or a lot of the recording artists, were now performing on national hookups. Um, and records were actually taking a nosedive. And so ASCAP was seeing the idea uh, of, and also, uh, well, let me back, back uh, continue on here. So ASCAP was seeing that revenue was declining from records, so they saw radio as a way of increasing their revenues. So by the time it got to 1940, they had tripled the rate, and the radio station said, we've had it with it. And there becomes the ASCAP radio wars. And what ends up happening is the radio said, we refuse to pay this. We're just not going to pay it. And ASCAP said, fine, we're pulling every ASCAP song off the radio. You cannot have a single radio uh, performance of an ASCAP tune. So that meant a lot of performers were suddenly out in the cold. What are we going to perform if we don't, if we can't perform our repertoire, which is all ASCAP? That's why you started hearing Stephen Foster songs. That's why Beautiful Dreamer became a hit again in 1940. That's why you heard Tchaikovsky's themes uh, and other classical pieces turned into pop songs because those pieces of music were in public domain and the, and they could then and be used on the radio. That's why classical music suddenly got a huge boost in 1940 because they they could be performed and that's why NBC brought on Walter Bruno and we started getting the NBC orchestra. Now they already had orchestras, but now they made it a focus of having classical music being performed on, uh, on, a, regular on a much more regular basis. Uh, and what it leads to is the, uh, the radio business forms the organization called Broadcast Music International, BMI for short. And this is the rival to ASCAP. What BMI does, um, they said, well, we'll license, they become a performance right organization like ASCAP, but they were primarily organized around uh, generating revenue from record sales and radio rather than from sheet music sales, music appearing in movies, uh, and the other performance rights that, that ASCAP was working with. Uh, so, that's, so you started hearing songs showing up. This is why you start hearing songs like 
Three Little Fishies and uh, Oops, There Goes Another Dam, all those kind of childish songs. Because the first set of composers that started printing music or uh, registering their music with BMI were, I'm going to be quite charitable, the third string composers. And so we were getting third string spring type of songs. So there were all these, and that's why kids songs showed up and all that. So BMI initially started out, uh, and it was, I should point out, it is a, a organized by the National Association of Broadcasters. And the National Association of Broadcasters was formed to fight ASCAP. So there's this, just to give you an idea of how, how these mechanisms play out. You hear about the National Association of Broadcasters all the time. Their primary focus when they first start was how do we stop ASCAP from screwing with our business? And as, so they were, the, they were the prime contestants in the war here. So BMI is formed. BMI had a different take on how they handled music. And that was, we will accept as printed anything in a recorded format. So that meant race records and hillbilly music suddenly had a home in the entertainment industry. And an, in a home in the entertainment industry that generated revenue. What ASCAP did was kill Tin Pan Alley. The whole basis of Tin Pan Alley was about selling sheet music. The whole basis of, and it was in, enforcement arm is ASCAP. The whole basis of the, of the radio industry it, it, you know, is playing live music and records. Its revenue base is off of record sales and record airplays. And what we see as radio, uh, uh, as entertainment goes on during the eight, uh, 1940s and the 1950s, this transformation in the music industry. The music industry finds itself, at, um, well, let's just be quite blunt. When, when at, ASCAP was the enforcement arm for Tin Pan Alley. The going after the record industry was at the behest, or going after the radio industry was at the behest of their members, the, the publishers and songwriters. By being greedy, and let's face it, they were being greedy, they killed the goose that laid the golden egg. So, after World War II, race records becomes R&B music. Hillbilly music becomes country and western music. And they go from being outside rural musics to the basis of the music that takes over the second half of the 20th century. Now, it takes a while for it to happen uh, because the, the, uh, it's essentially what we, we really are talking about when we get to this point is that the radio industry or the, the publishing industry thought mechanical music was its uh, uh, existential threat. It turned out its existential threat was the radio industry because the radio industry brought in a whole series of artists that didn't need the publisher anymore. Remember that diagram I showed you earlier where the publisher was between the performer and uh, um, the songwriter and the performer in the audience. Well, a lot of times country musicians and blues musicians, they were the composers uh, of, of the music. And so they were dealing directly with the label, uh, with the record label and BMI, rather than having to go through a publisher. So they cut the publishers out and the publishers start seeing a precipitous decline in income. And that also corresponds with the rise of rock and roll in the 50s. Well, we see radio starts playing more and more artists who aren't artists from the Tin Pan Alley tradition, who aren't singing from the Great American Songbook. And so we start getting rival stations, um, especially at, in large cities, there were a lot of black stations that would be featuring nothing but these R&B records and jazz records. And many of these artists, again, if they had any music published, it was secondary to their records. And so Tin Pan Alley starts withering on the vine. And a very interesting 
a way of looking at is what happens between 1950 and 1955. At the beginning of 1950, we can still be talking about Tin Pan Alley as the dominant form of music. Ella Fitzgerald is singing, Frank Sinatra is singing, but they're singing from the Great American Songbook. Almost all the major artists uh, on, um, outside of rock and roll uh, at, the, at the beginning, well, rock and roll hasn't started. At the beginning of the 50s, we're talking about all these artists who uh, were singing from the Great American Songbook. I mean, we can, Dean Martin uh, and the big bands were, were sort of doing it, what was left of the big band movement in 1950. But, and the recording industry, for the most part, was leaning on these music. I mean, Frank Sinatra was a big artist. Ella Fitzgerald was a big artist. And in fact, they formed the Grammys in the, uh, well, that's a whole different story. I'll save that for a little bit later. Uh, so, but as the 50s goes along, we start seeing more of these R&B stations popping up, more of young people listening not to the great songbooks, to R&B artists. And by the middle of the 50s, when Elvis shows up, that is when the crisis really uh, comes to the fruition for BMI, uh, for ASCAP. Congress, in its infinite wisdom, holds a congressional hearing on the state of the music industry. And one of the panels, and I wish I could find this picture again, it's this wonderful picture of three older gentlemen in suits and ties, and they all have spectacles on, they're very um, well-to-do businessmen, they're representatives of the music publishing industry, and they're telling the congressman, rock and roll's an aberration, it'll go away, it's just a fad, we have the good music, when the young people come to their senses, they will come back to the good music, and you will not have to fear rock and roll. As far as I know, those three gentlemen are still sitting at the table waiting for this aberration to go away. There's probably cobwebs over them and stuff. It didn't go away. And over the course from 1950 to 1960, as you chart the top 10 hits, they go from being at the beginning of the 50s, primarily ASCAP, to the end of the 50s, primarily BMI. And with that loss of revenue, and with the fact that the focus has shifted away from printed music onto records, Tin Pan Alley fades from the musical scene as an important feature. However, they've left their mark because the whole basis of the record industry and, and uh, recording industry and now the digital industry is based on the very rights generated out of the 1906 copyright law that Tin Pan Alley demanded from Congress. And basically, uh, I've gone a little short here, but that's basically all the material I have. I, well, uh, let me tell you the story about the Grammys. The, 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 and this is something I just learned. The Grammys were formed in the late 50s by the industry as an attempt to stem the bleeding uh, of the industry to rock and roll. If you go back and look at the first decade or so of the records of, of, of the Grammys, they were, no, there's no rock and roll in it. They were primarily trying to focus on the good music, big band music, singing, classical music, folk music, spoken word, anything but that aberration rock and roll that was destroying the minds of the youth. And so if you go and look at the first Grammys, they are for, uh, Ella Fitzgerald pulls down like seven in the first 10 years, of, or first five years of the Grammys. Uh, and so it gives you an idea of, of, of how much they're focused. Now the Grammys, they're wrapped. They're not even rock and roll anymore. We're all the way into a whole different world that none of us want to know about. All right, so that's how, what I have for you. I will entertain any and all questions at this point.